Hey guys, so in the last lecture we wrapped up with chapter 7 in which we talked about the Industrial Revolution, um, especially in the North with the advancements in communication and transportation, and also the spread of agriculture throughout the South. So as the cities became more populated, there became needs for reforms. So in the mid-1800s, um, there was various reforms. Each one will go over in this lecture and with this lecture I'm going to do it a little bit different. I have questions after each slide. Um, once I tell you about you know what happened in the 1800s we try to connect it to today and this is really fun activity when we're in class so I'm going to have you guys answer these questions on a separate document but as you listen to this lecture just think about these questions so you can answer them later. So the first reform movement we're going to be talking about is education, then prison reform, the temperance movement, abolition, and the women's movement. So the first one we're going to be talking about is public education. <clears throat> so Americans argue that a country could not exist without liter literate citizens. Smart citizens equaled a better country. Um, you cannot make informed decisions about your government unless you can you know, read the newspaper, unless you can read the laws, know what that president or what that congressman stands for. So people needed to be literate in order to participate in democracy. Um, it also helped the poor from being oppressed. Uh, usually during this time period, unless you lived in some communities in New England, if your parents didn't have the money to send you to school, you largely just got an edu or you mostly just got an education with whatever your parents could teach you. I mean, generally they may be able to teach you the basics, a little bit of reading and writing, um, usually good enough to maybe read the Bible, something like that. But you were not going to, you know, develop those skills. Um, some and many poor people were illiterate. They didn't have a parent that knew how to read and write, and therefore they didn't know how to read and write. Um, and so. An educated citizenry allows you to move up into jobs that, you know, normally wouldn't have been available to you. Um, with free public education, you can now, you know, get those skills in order to get a higher paying job. Um, so Horace Mann is considered the father of public education, uh, and he believed that education should be offered to everyone. But it's important to note here, not everyone got the opportunity to go to these early public schools. In the beginning, it was just young white males that were able to go, then eventually females. And then later on, um, minorities also got to or got access to public education, mainly after the Civil War. Uh, Horace Mann, if any of you guys want to be a teacher, you'll learn about him in college. But Horace Mann um, was the first secretary of education for the state of Massachusetts and he was the first person to use state or state taxes in order to fund schools before Horace Mann the main way schools are pub are funded in New England is through you know a local tax so um, parents in the community would pull their money together to try to hire a teacher or a tutor to come in for a certain amount of time in the year and teach their children uh, in the 1850s, most northern states, or by the 1850s, most northern states had public education, and the number of attending schools, or students attending schools, more than doubled. And this was all supported by tax money. That's how they got the funding for these public schools. And so, what I want you guys to think about now, and these will be the questions you'll answer on a separate document, is think about our school. What are some of the issues or concerns at your own school what are some issues you know I understand things now but think back before that what were some of the issues that we had at our school and what would your solution to the problem be it's easy to point out all the problems but you know sometimes you gotta be able to provide a solution and how would you put this reform into place so these questions I want you to answer on a separate document and next we have prison reform, and the leader of this prison reform movement is Dorothea Dix. Um, she visits the prisons, writes about them, and when she goes to these prisons in the early 1800s, 
Inmates are dressed in rags, they're poorly fed, they could be chained to the walls or chained together, and all criminals were housed together. So say you did petty theft, say you stole like a loaf of bread, you could be stuck in the same cell as you know somebody that had murdered multiple people. So there was no separation of the class of crime that you had committed. And so, Dorothea Dick's work led to the construction of many mental facilities throughout the United States. One of the main things that she focused on was people that were mentally ill being thrown into prison because there was no help for them outside of the prison system. And they definitely weren't getting any help in these nasty prisons. So, she developed treatment for the mentally ill. So, if someone had been diagnosed as mentally ill, they could go to one of these asylums that Dorothea Dix had created instead of going to prison. And so I want you guys to connect it to today and think about what are some of the issues that prisons face today? And then what would your solution to the problem be? Trust me, you can do a quick Google search of issues facing our prisons in the United States today and you'll find plenty of things to talk about here. And next we have the temperance movement. So with the temperance movement mainly what it was focused on was to ban the sale and consumption of alcohol. So in the you know, 1830s the average American drank almost four times as much alcohol as they do today and this obviously led to many social problems. Um, obviously, drinking alcohol can cause many health concerns. So, you know, it can cause liver damage, it can cause kidney damage, uh, all sorts of things are associated um, or, you know, with drinking alcohol and its effect on your health. Then you have mainly the social concerns, and really, this kind of coincides with the third bullet point there about domestic violence. So, um, there was a concern growing that, you know, there was a lot of absence of fathers, you know, people were drinking too much. Um, domestic violence rises or the cases of domestic violence rises when alcohol is involved so it was really this uh, movement was led by women because you know women tend to be you know the ones who suffer from domestic violence cases and so they were successful uh, the consumption of alcohol drops between 1830 and 1860 and some states for example, Maine will go as far as to ban alcohol, but prohibition will not be enacted until the 18th Amendment in the early um, 1920s and then repealed later on with the 21st Amendment. And so, let's connect this to today. Do you, you consider the amount of alcohol Americans consume in 2014 to be a problem? This is an old lecture, so, you know, think you know, 2019, 2020, um, and you can find those statistics online. Um, most um, Americans do drink. Um, some, you know, drink in excess. I believe somewhere in the ballpark of 5 to 10% of American adults are considered heavy drinkers. So, why or why not? I mean, think about, you know, what are some of the problems that we have, you know, today with alcohol consumption and many of them can be tied over to the problems that were happening back in the early 1800s you can look at domestic violence you can look at drunk driving cases all these things you can look at you know directly point to alcohol consumption and so i want you guys to look into do you think americans consume too much alcohol or not And so we have the anti-slavery movement, the abolition movement. So remember, abolition is wanting the abolishment of slavery, to end slavery. And so this is a slow process that began in the 1700s. Um, you know, there was debate during the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, should we outlaw slavery? And they had mainly said when they drafted the Constitution that they would not outlaw slavery, so that way the southern states would ratify the Constitution, but they had put it in there that slavery should be phased out, and by, I believe it was 1815, 1820, they wanted the number of slaves to be reduced to half of what they were in the 1700s. Obviously, this didn't happen. It went the other way. Um, in the early 1800s, the slave populations boomed. I mean, you're talking about tripled uh, in some places from what they were at the end of the 1700s. 
Um, so the importation of slaves is banned in 1808, but just because it was banned didn't mean slaves were still not being imported. Um, I believe the last slave ship came to the United States in actually the 1850s, so getting close up to the Civil War. Um, but even though the importation of slaves may be banned, you still had the slave trade going on. Because remember, if you were born a slave, uh, your mother was a slave, and you know uh, you could still be sold into slavery. So there was no way to escape uh, being a slave if your parents were slaves. Um, there was an idea of an American colony society um, that said, you know, let's start a colony for these African American uh, slaves in Liberia. Had moderate success, um, but the movement divides, though. Um, we have women's participation, we have race and tactics. So, one of the reasons abolition is so slow to take effect is because many people have different ideas on how it should happen. Some believe that slave owners should be paid for their slaves, some believe that the United States should just abolish slavery, um, and some, you know, advocate for what they call gradual emancipation, where, you know, slowly over time, slave owners would get rid of their slaves in turn for agricultural equipment or industrialized equipment. Um, and then around the world, uh, many former or many uh, countries, such as England, had abolished the slave trade. Mexico had abolished the slave trade. France had abolished the slave trade. So the United States was really one of the last holdouts when it came to slavery. So you have some of the main people here, Frederick Douglass, you guys may have talked about him in English class, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, he was the author of The Liberator. I'll go more over these uh, figures uh, in the later lecture. And so we have the women's rights movement. So we talked about Lowell Mills, women going to work in the mills, getting their own wages, having their own jobs outside the home. Um, so women joined these reform movements. Women were a big part of the abolitionist movement, were um, able to relate to the, some of the oppression that slaves faced. Now, obviously not the same level, but still being oppressed by their government and society. And so they also advocated for prison reform. Many got behind Dorothea Dix and her movement. Um, many started to question the role, their roles in society. Um, we have the Seneca Falls Convention, one of the most monumental women's rights movement that takes place in 1814, the first women's rights convention in the United States. And what they were advocating for was women's suffrage, so that is the right for women to vote. Unfortunately, they don't, um, they're not successful in this movement until a lot later on in um, 1918 with the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gives women's, the, women the right to vote. And then we have the Declaration of Sentiments of Rights of Women, uh, which they issued to Congress to try to advocate for you know more rights for women in politics and in society. So, American women today. So, what stereotypes do American face? Are American women face now? Do they face uh, any stereotypes today? Um, and then, do you feel women are treated equal in the workplace? You know, this is obviously an opinionated question. Uh, you can throw in some facts there if you can find them. But you know, think about what women were fighting for back then, and some of the things women are still fighting for today. And so, do you think um, women are still facing stereotypes, and do you think they are treated equal in the workplace? So, obviously, we're not going to do that right there. So, I just want to leave you guys with that. Uh, I will be posting these questions in a separate document for you guys to answer. And as always, if you have any questions, just shoot me an email.